have a niece. Her initials are TNT. TNT? Yeah. Like the dynamite? Yeah. TNT. Taylor Nicole Teach. Ooh. Taylor Nicole Teach. Nice. All right, TJ, just give us like, like 10 seconds All right. of silence, and then we're going to get started asking questions. You can't stand your head and then start asking questions. Mr. Teach, where did you grow up? In a small town called Tampico, Illinois. All right. About 130 miles out of Chicago. Uh, when did you go into the service? Went into the service in 1939. No, 1940, I'm 1940. sorry. Uh, what conflicts or wars did you take part in? World War II. World War II. What were you doing when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor? I was enjoying life at uh, just outside of Roswell, New Mexico, and I was in the service then. But I was skiing. Huh. <laughs> With what units did you serve? Well, I started my service in the uh, National Guard, and how that occurred was simply that in 1938, Hitler invaded Poland. And a group of us at the school I was attending decided that we would probably be at war. And uh, why don't, uh, being the smart one, sign up on the National Guard and prepare yourself so you don't get caught up in it as a foot soldier or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did, but they federalized the National Guard before I could accomplish my mission as far as going off to training school. Which theater of war were you in? I was in the CBI, China, Burma, India. Mm -hmm. uh, which battles did you take part in? Well, I flew the very first mission against Japan, uh, from land base that is. B-25s took off, Billy Mitchells. But uh, I flew out of China and bombed Japan. Uh, what specific details do you remember about combat, sights, sounds, and what you saw? What I saw was uh, what war could do to people and uh, how insensitive you can become. What was the worst moment? Taking off from a base in China and having, just before I took off, the plane in front of me crashed, and they were all my buddies, and uh, we had to take off through the, the debris. Tell me about the, uh, the chaos of war. Did you know where the enemy was at all times? Well, being a pilot and in the air most of the time, we were looking for them always. We never knew quite where they were until they showed up and tried to knock us out of the air. Uh, did you always know what your objective was? In flight, yes, always. Mm -hmm. You had alternative targets. If we were to bomb Japan and weather not permitting, we could bomb the coast of China in certain areas. How did you feel towards the people that you fought? Nothing. Nothing. I had no feeling whatsoever. Uh, what types of uh, aircraft did you fly or fly in? B-29. It was a uh, very first big super fortress. I flew B-17s prior to that. And then when they rolled this thing out, they put me on a B-29. It, uh, first time I looked at it, I said it couldn't fly. It was too big, and certainly I couldn't do it, but it worked out. Uh, what, did, what did you most miss from home while you were overseas? Family. Family, I think, is about it. I don't mean to be too, too succinct on it, but mm -hmm. I think that's the total sum of it. After the war was over, was it easy to put the experience behind you? It took about two years. Uh, 
my wife would be one better to answer that than I, because she had to put up with me. Mm -hmm. What do we need to remember about World War II? The sheer devastation that it caused and the millions of lives that were lost. However, that particular war I felt was very justified. Other than that, I can't think of anything. We don't seem to have learned too much from it. Thank you very much, Mr. Teach. That's all the questions we have for you today. Thank you. Mr. Teach, I'm going to ask you a couple more. I'm going to throw in some more questions. We're going to, we're going to put this all together later. Um, they're going to be kind of out of order. But when you were, um, when you got back, and even till today, um, my grandfather served in World War II, and he, he's, I was, I was living in Hawaii at the time when I was a kid, and there were a lot of Japanese that lived there. Yeah. And he said, even this was in the 70s, he said, I, I feel very uncomfortable, very uncomfortable being around all these Japanese. Do you still feel any kind of animosity or have any kind of, um, uh, you know, any feelings Ill, Ill will towards the Japanese? Not really anymore. I did at the time, of course. We all did. Like 911 created a sudden feeling of hatred against a, a group. And I think Pearl Harbor did that to us. And uh, yeah, I felt very uncomfortable being around Japanese. In fact, I was asked one time if I'd ever been to Japan. I said, no, I bombed it. And that's about the sum and substance of it. Now, uh, you were in, you're part of the, the China, uh, Burma. China, Burma, India. India. And that's something that most people um, don't Did, know much about. They didn't know we were there. They didn't, don't even understand. Um, could you explain how, um, like how, how you guys operated in that theater? Uh, first of all, let me say that we took off from Gander, Newfoundland uh, on a very secret basis. We were equipped with sheepskin clothing and that type of thing. We thought we were going to a cold climate. And actually when we got our flight instructions, we took off to Marrakech, Africa. So we flew nonstop from Gander to the coast of Africa. That was our first drop. We stayed there and then flew to uh, Cairo, Egypt, and then had to do a, a roundabout because we couldn't fly over some countries and went into uh, Karachi, India, which is now Pakistan. And uh, it was difficult over there because we had, particularly in China, we had runways that were gravel made uh, a large rock, a smaller than on down to the pea size or whatever. So that we needed at least 10,000 feet to take off because we weighed 144,000 pounds at takeoff. And when you'd sit at the end of the runway and have that four 3,350 engines revved up, you'd sit there with the brakes on and you'd release it and the the plane would give a little bit of a lurch back and then it'd start to rumble down that rock runway. And when you got to the final very end of it, you had to be very careful about lifting it or pulling back on it because it sometimes wasn't quite airworthy yet. So you would uh, raise it and let it back down easy because you had 500 pound bombs aboard and then bounce it a little bit and then take off and fly on up. So uh, the hardships were more in the surroundings that we had to fly in. India wasn't too bad. We lived in thatch covered huts and had outside water and ceramic bowls hanging from the ceiling. And uh, when we wanted to chill anything, we would pour gasoline over it and let it evaporate which is the basics of refrigeration. And uh, the nearest thing to eating over there was, I shall never forget, their bread. You'd hold it up to light and pull out the bull weevils and put it together and uh, put gravy on it and that was your dinner. You could tell when they had uh, buffalo stew, they called it. You'd, you got within a half a mile, 
you'd smell it. Once you'd lose your appetite. I went from 178 pounds down to 140 when I returned. So the food wasn't very good. I missed the food. <laughs> when you guys are uh, doing your missions, um, were you, because uh, I'm not sure exactly what years uh, you were over there, did you find, um, being a person, I don't know much about um, air, you know, bombing and yeah. stuff like that, um, from what I, what I gather from books and the, and the films, did you find um, that the, uh, the pilots, that I guess they probably sent them fighter pilots to uh, shoot you guys down, did you find them you know, excellent pilots? Or? Oh, they were excellent pilots. The only difference was that we, we were flying at 25,000 feet which was the highest, at that time, flying aircraft. And they couldn't quite come up to our, uh, initially, to our altitude. But then they found us, and they were damn good. But they were crazy, because they, we were on a mission over to Japan in Iwata, I believe it was. No, it wasn't Iwata, one of the cities over there. And we were flying three, the biggest formation we could ever get together would be three, because we flew from China, and then circled over there one time because we didn't have enough fuel to get back. We did it more than once. Pick up three aircraft, go in and bomb. Well, there was a kamikaze came in, hit the lead aircraft, and both of killed three ships right there. And we were down here. So, uh, yeah, it's, they found us. Did you find uh, that um, at the beginning of your... your um your flights or, or your your, uh, your service that the um, the Japanese war machine was kind of slowing down. Could you tell that was you were having an effect? Or? No, I didn't. I couldn't tell that because we were very early in the war, being the first to bomb Japan from land based, and uh, our group went over the Tinian Islands, and I returned to the States. Okay. Now that was quite a story in itself. A very little vignette here. I was taken off of an aircraft and a crew that we became very close family. And uh, to fly a war weary B-29 back to the States, my crew went on off on a mission with another pilot, co-pilot, and uh, they were hit. But they landed in Gladivostok, Russia, and we were, we knew it but couldn't tell anyone. So when we came back, when I got back to, to Florida, believe it or not, I called my wife to let her know I was all right. And I was, she said, where are you? I said, I'm in the States. She said, well, I've been getting calls from all the crew about the crew from their wives. They were lost in action. I said, well, you can call them all back. Tell them they're okay, but I can't tell you where they are. So she got on the phone, called them all back. That's because the, Russia wasn't, wasn't at war with Jet. No, Japan, no, right. right. Okay. Um, but that's how they got their first B-29. Oh, and yeah, they copied course. it down to the nut. Oh, wow. They stole all the stuff. That was the movie on that. Oh, really? Yeah. And with my crew. Yeah. That's awesome. Did you, um, now, forgive me if I, if I get the man's name wrong, Do Little's Raiders, did you have any, uh, I heard they were absorbed into the, the China Burma. Uh, well, well, they they flew off the Doolittle, that was off the carrier. Yes. And uh, they flew into uh, bomb Japan, but uh, they had no place to land. They crashed and bailed out and oh. that type of thing. So they're never part of the China Burma India. Okay. They, the P forties who, uh, flying tigers, those they were the first to be active. At, the China Burma. But we used to fly from India to China taking bombs, anywhere from 500 pounders, 40 of them, and high octane gas, store it in China, back and forth over the hump, which was quite a chore in itself, and uh, then take off and bomb Japan, come back and then start that routine all over again. So we'd fly the hump maybe three or four times just to get enough fuel and gas 
in China to take off to bomb Japan. And our missions were around 12 hours and a half, 12 hours and 45 minutes in the air. That's a long time. So you're flying over the Himalayas. Right. So you had to, that was not, not an easy flight to make. Definitely not. I mean, even today, I'm sure it's pretty, pretty bad. Well, you don't see it too often when you're even in the air, because it's cloud shrouded and 29,000 feet, and you're flying at 25. Some of those clouds are, have rock centers. Is there anything um, you'd want um, this generation to know or, um, <laughs> about, you know, you, you, when you went in, you were probably eight, when you went in the, the National Guard, you are probably in your late teens or early 20s. Early 20s. Early 20s. Um, is there anything you want, you know, the, this generation that's coming up to understand, uh, you know, what might be a difference, but not, not like derogatory, but what might be, a, what they should understand about your generation? That great generation, was, I think it was written up by one of the columnists. Uh, I think, uh, I couldn't say that. I think the, I feel for the current generation going through what they have to as far as the drug and the uh, uh, breakdown of the family. Uh, and I'd just like to put this in, the, in, in proper context. I was in the service four and a half years. And when I left, I owed the Air Force. I owed the service. They didn't owe me a thing. And I never asked for anything. Simply because I was so grateful to, for the training I had, to come out with the skill of being able to fly one of a couple of million dollar aircraft, that type of thing. I owed it. And I think this, these guys wouldn't like, but I'm for uh, the draft. I think everyone in this country should serve one lousy year of their life when they come out of high school, when they sort of get their feet on the ground and what it's all about, and then go off to school. I think they'd be a little bit more solidified in their thinking. Oh, well, I agree with you 100%. Um, do you, is there anything you remember about, you're talking about your crew, and uh, um, you know, I'm sure you, you, you work with them a lot. Do you, is there any kind of, uh, what would you like to tell us about the camaraderie you had in your air crew? Oh, they were, we were one for all, one for, you know, that old cliche. We were very close, family-wise, the wives, and they were all very close. These, I mean, did you keep up with them after? Unfortunately, no. It's amazing. What made you decide, I mean, you joined the National Guard, um, what made you decide to become a pilot? Well, when I found out what Pearl Harbor occurred after I was in the National Guard, and then I just determined that we were playing for keeps, this was going to be, someone's going to be shooting at you, you know. So I thought I would rather be up there one-on-one -on -one than being led by some of the incompetence that I witnessed in the ground forces. We were not yet prepared for war. We were still playing. So when we were going to play for keeps, I thought I should get up there. I'd much rather take you on and you take me on and may the better man win. All right. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us about uh, your experiences? I could probably go on and ramble on for a boring another half hour, but I don't think so really. It's been a pleasure, and it's right. nice to see these yeah, uh, you, young guys. Your son's saying about you, you, you crash landed once. Can you tell us about that? Well, we were coming back from Japan and uh, a raid, and uh, we had spent a little bit more time over there than we should have. And I won't blame the general who led the parade, but he was, I thought, at fault. And uh, we ran out of fuel and landed at 12 o'clock midnight in China with no lights, and uh, was fortunate enough to get to the, our air base, but didn't dare land on the runway because everybody was coming in, and we didn't want to crowd it up, so we landed alongside the runway uh, with one engine running, and uh, managed to get out. We bailed the crew out. They landed all over the 
countryside in China. One of them landed in a that went right through the roof. You can imagine this at night, and a Chinese couple in bed, and here comes a shoot through the roof with a guy hanging off. And we, the expression was "ding ow, ding ow, everything's okay, ding ow." And uh, one of them got in. He landed a little. We were only at about 1,100 feet by the time they bailed out, so it was awfully low. And uh, one of them landed in a tree, dropped and broke a leg. Another one landed in a rice paddy. And he was sloshing around out there, and he'd fire his gun to try to get somebody to come help him. Well, the guy over here with a broken leg, every time he fired, he ducked. <laughs> they finally, finally got out. We didn't lose a guy. They all made it. Uh, out of curiosity, um, that was uh, when China was still kind of in the infancy of communism. Did you have any dealings with the communists at all? Or? None whatsoever. We had some ne'er do wells who tried to uh, set fire to our ships and things like that at night. We had to stand guard, and uh, that was about it. We shot a few of them, but not many. I, it's kind of off so they were, oh, I saw this uh, interview. I think it was actually some of the uh, Doolittle's, Doolittle's Raiders. One of the guys, cr Crash Man, was, they were brought in, and he's got a picture with him in Mao Zedong. Uh, I got a name for it. <laughs> yeah, right. You do. Communist leader. That's people like, yeah, I know Mao Zedong. I actually have a picture of him. <laughs> arm and arm. But I'm not going to keep you any longer. We really appreciate you coming by. Fine, my pleasure. fascinating. And uh, thank you for your service. Thank you. And I'm absolutely agreement. I absolutely agree with you with the draft. So. Okay, fine. I'm gonna grab this. One. Oh yeah. Get you, get you out, of, out of here. How can I get a copy of this? Yeah. Uh, if you give me your address, I'll I'll, uh, I'll make you a copy. Oh, that'd be awfully nice. So. Give it to the kids. Sure. I'd I'd like to watch. <laughs> His uh, plane was actually.